This is Duke University. Okay, so on Pfingstsonntag, June 1922, in the tourism resort St. Nicola in the Strudengau in Upper Austria, um, the retired salt works manager and German-Austrian Alpine Club Alpenvereins activist Hans Reinl sits with a group of like-minded conservative companions in, the local, in a local garden inn where he laments, laments about the book Aus Österreichs Revolution that was published the year before by one of the current social democratic leaders, Julius Deutsch. In the book, Deutsch had given an account of his political and military career in the last years of the Habsburg Empire as a car and car officer and a social democratic labor union delegate at the Ministry of War and as a state secretary for military affairs in the first years of the new Austrian Republic. Reinl accused Deutsch of villainish deeds, Schuftereien, of being a traitor to the emperor, who by forming a confidential organization of party men in the Habsburg army, broke his oath as an officer. By accident, Julius Deutsch, who is on a weekend trip with female friends, is sitting at one of the next tables. He confronts his opponent and after a dispute in which Reinl repeats his insults, decides to bring him to trial in a lawsuit of honor. One year later, in May 1923, the trial is conducted at the near district court of Grein an der Donau with a defending lawyer, the young Hans Gürtler, trying to prove the truth of Reinl's public statements by using anti-Semitic arguments. In the hearing, Reinl claims that he and his friends were only having an academic discussion about the, quote, old Hebrew term shufiden, um, that is, uh, Jewish leaders or, quote, people's delegates who had a military guard to protect them and who suppressed other peoples. In 1918, another quote, Jewish revolutionaries or elements who are alien to the folk and the country had tried to seize power in, in many nations, and in this sense, Deutsch's actions could well be called Schufterei. The trial was adjourned for the statement of the absent plaintiff Deutsch and rescheduled for June 1923. In a year of national elections, with Deutsch being nominated as a leader of the new paramilitary social democratic Republican Schutzbund, the lawsuit would be getting high media coverage, but in the end, the court's verdict would not rehabil rehabilitate Deutsch's honor. Here we have a picture of Deutsch in Carinthia in October 1923, which fits to Helmut's paper, with the guy over there, and it's a rally of the Schutzbund, and he was like giving a speech uh, in the, uh, before the elections, 1923. So Deutsch put a lot of efforts in the preparation of his testimony and commissioned it even, uh, even commissioned it uh, to being published as a brochure. However, in the second hearing, the district court followed the anti-Semitic arguments of the defending lawyer. So Reinl was convicted for using the word Schuft, villain, in the dispute with Deutsch. He was acquitted for the initially, initially, initially used term Schuftereien since Deutsch, Deutsch was, quote, at least partly of Jewish descent, the verdict said, describing his deeds in, in this way was just a claim that he would act for his nation to the disadvantage of other nations, a behavior that cannot be called dishonorable on the grounds of the penal law. Both parties filed an appeal, but in November 1923, the regional court trial in the town of Linz was to proceed even less favorably for Deutsch. The opponent's defending lawyer now focused on Deutsch's alleged undermining activities at the Imperial Ministry of War in 1917 and 18. He claimed that Deutsch had promoted the revolution, quote, with dirty metal, methods, and that the court should therefore acquit the defendant. If not, then the first paragraph of the Austrian Constitution should read, quote, spying, treason, and defection are the heroic virtues of the Austrian citizen, end of quote. 
In fact, Reinl was now acquitted from all charges and the court argued that Deutsch's book aus Österreich's Revolution had served as a proof of truth for the defendant. Okay, so what, first of all, makes this case study interesting, I think, is the fact that it can be linked to a whole series of similar Austrian political trials in the interwar years, like other courts of injustice, as Lisa Silverman calls them, um, Deutsch's lawsuit unfolds into a stage, quote, upon which performances of Jewish difference served both to reinforce and redefine its boundaries. Deutsch never identified himself publicly with his Jewish family background. In fact, it became a blank space of his biography. In the courtroom, however, he was forced to engage explicitly with it, and he had to accept that the juridical and discursive power of definition was in the hands of the anti-Semites. At the trial, all three key issues of our conference, empire, socialism, and Jews, met in a discursive assemblage. In the following, I will therefore focus on Deutsch's retrospective narration of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in his courtroom speech and the insights that can be gained from the trial about the antagonistic political arena of the new nation state Deutsch Österreich, where the claim of Julius Deutsch as a social democrat to represent the proletarian working class and the working people, das arbeitende Volk, was challenged by the racial and ethnical concepts of the German folk that were articulated by his Catholic and right-wing political opponents. In his speech in the courtroom in Grein, Deutsch tried to challenge the accusation of having broken his oath as an officer and denied that he had started his confidential work as early as summer 1917, as Reinl had claimed in a letter to the press, quote, to promote the inner collapse of our victorious army, end of quote. But only one year later, when the war was in fact lost. Clearly, the anti-Semitic allegation of a stab in the back to the Empire's army hung in the air. In court, Deutsch gave an account of his military career as a young artillery officer in the World War and about his appointment into the Ministry of War in December 1917, where he served, nominated by the Trade Union Commission as a social policy consultant in the Bureau of Wartime, Eco Wartime Economy. From that time on, Deutsch claimed his uniform was nothing but a forced formality. Quote, as long as I was at the front lines, I was an officer. In the Ministry of War, I was a delegate, Vertrauensmann of the unionized workers. From summer 1918 onward, as he described in his book Aus Österreich's Revolution, he used his position to build a secret military organization in the Viennese garrisons, a network of social democratic soldiers that would form the core of the new People's Army, Volkswehr, in November 1918. He justified these actions with the intentions of the army command to use troops in Vienna, quote, against st strike or other revolutionary uprisings. And in order not to become a villainous traitor of the people, as he called it, he had to choose between, quote, the officer's oath that I did not give by choice, and the sense of community with the working people, a subject's lo loyalty to the emperor whom I never recognized voluntarily, or the male pride of a Republican who, in the hour of emergency, stands by his people and not with the blood-stained arch house of Habsburg." End of quote. In the regional court of appeal in Linz, Deutsch and his lawyers tried to point out that his supervisors in the Ministry of War were well aware of his political bias as an opponent of the government, as he called it, whose loyalty was with his party, and that his formerly, Ill formerly illegal actions were in fact tolerated in the shaky political situation of 1918. In Deutsch's speech, the empire, empire primarily represented a military power structure that was responsible for the continuation of war with all its suffering and the wartime suspension of democratic rights and social achievements. Using the historic, historical examples of the Swiss hero Wilhelm Tell and popular leaders of the peasant wars, Deutsch tried to justify the right to revolt against the Habsburg's hangman. 
he reminded the audience that Christian social leaders as well broke their oath in the autumn of 1918 and that the government was overturned by way of a revolution that in the words of Hans Kelsen, popular sovereignty replaced the divine right. During the war, however, Deutsch had written in a slightly different way about the dynasty. In his wartime notes, Kriegserlebnisse eines Friedliebenden, written in 1917, he called Franz Josef an emperor of peace who only failed to stop a war, quote, that arose from the antagonism of capitalist forces. And his impressions of the here apparent Karl, whom he met several times behind the front lines, were also more or less favorable. It is indicative, however, that in both his courtroom speeches, Deutsch did not refer to the anti-Semitic accusations of his opponents. Deutsch, who, who was born in 1884 to a poor Jewish family in the Western Hungarian provinces, which later became the Burgenland, became the Burgenland, and who migrated to Vienna as a child, he had left the Jewish religious community as a young man in 1905. Similar, similarly to most of his party colleagues, it was German culture that for him epitomized enlightenment and progress. Um, and there are only a few ego documents that involve Deutsch's explicit engagement with Jewish difference, Jewish identity. Um, and in his autobiography, the issue of Judaism is totally left out. But by the days of regime change in the fall of 1918, Deutsch, who was now a prominent social democratic leader, was confronted with anti-Semitic harassment. And in his political life, all elements of the social democrats' complex response to anti-Semitism can be found, including his own use of anti-Semitic imagery. For Deutsch and the social democrats, the main political conflict line was not anti-Semitism, but the antagonism with the conservative opponents. And it is telling and disturbing, for instance, how Deutsch judged the Aryan paragraph that was introduced in most Austrian Alpine clubs, Alpenverein, between 1919 and 1921. For Deutsch, the Alpenverein was, quote, a reservoir of all reactionary elements who observed the rise of the working class, the working class with poisonous hatred. And under the pretense to keep off the Jews, Deutsch argued the Alpine Association had in fact evicted the workers from the Alpine Club's mountain refugees, refugees, so the mountain huts. In the courtroom of the Grein trial, Deutsch was now forced by the judge to answer the matter of his Jewish descent. This is hard to determine, Deutsch said. Quote, as it is quoted in the newspapers, his family had lived in the Burgenland for many generations. One branch of the family is Jewish, but not the other. He might thus be a half-Jew. Incidentally, the family tradition tells that the ancestors adopted the Jewish faith during the time of the persecution of the Protestants, and the whole family would therefore be of Aryan descent. End of quote. The Christian social press jumped the Deutsch testimonial with pleasure and for them, he remained Jewish. Um, Deutsch's decision to publish his courtroom speech as a brochure followed a prominent example. In late 1923, Friedrich Adler would publish or republish his famous speech of defense that he had given at the special court trial in 1917 when he was accused of murdering the um, imperial prime minister, Count Stürk. And the connection between Deutsch's lawsuit and Adler, who was a favorite target of the right-wing press, was also made by the Christian socials, denouncing them both as, not least, as Jewish. In 1923, Adler had just fired a liberal suit to challenge the insulting description as an assassin, Meuchelmörder, and the Reichspost stated ironically, quote, Adler's party comrade and fellow tribesman, Stammesgenosse, Julius Deutsch, also felt offended in his honor and went to court. There must be a special blend of qualities that the kinds of Adler and Deutsch exhibit, 
since non-Marxists and non-Jews in the same position would not file a complaint, but wish the ground would open up and swallow them. But a trial of insulted honor was not a defense of life and death, and thus Deutsch's heroic stylization in court was mocked by his political opponents as an example of his well-known vanity. He elaborated on the role of his female companion in St. Nicola and key witness, Marie Kramer, who allegedly had entrapped him to his blinded male defense of honor. The communist paper Rote Fahne, that attacked the former state secretary Deutsch on a regular basis for marginalizing the Red Guards and for his policy against revolutionary communist activities in the first years of the Republic, now called him a childish and vain man who at least contributes to the amusement of his fellow audience. And they continued, a true revolutionary should be proud of the insults of a monarchist and will not go to a bourgeois court. In Becoming Austrians, Lisa argues that within the contested conceptions of the new deutsch österreichische Republik, Jewish difference became a means, quote, to interpret clarify and critique the terms of the country's altered political, social, and economic circumstances. And this assumption can actually be applied to the deutsch Reinl trial, because it revolved around the nature and character of the people, Staatsvolk, and its legitimate representatives, the discursive struggle for a hegemonic definition of political antagonisms, and the articulation of a conjunctive national representative claim. Similar to other trials in the interwar years, the defense tried to establish a specific narrative of the events, quote, by assigning qualities coded as Jewish and not Jewish to victims and perpetrators. And in a grand trial, the defending lawyer Gürtler wanted to give the proof of truth for Deutsch's Schuftereien by exposing him as a Jewish revolutionary, Revolutionsjude. Deutsch's reference to historic heroic leaders such as Wilhelm Tell or the German peasant revolters would be ridiculous and an act of, act of hubris, since as a Jew, he did not have the right to compare himself to these popular folk figures. Quote, Dr. Deutsch as an Austrian Wilhelm Tell resembles an operetta figure, figure. And it is no coincidence that a cartoon in the Reichspost drew an, on this image, comparing Deutsch to the true Wilhelm Tell who did not break his oath, the Gutlisch war. The mocking of Deutsch as a costumed tell points to a further facet of the trial. The lawsuit was conducted in a territory rather hostile to Deutsch, both in terms of symbolic topography and actual political power. As a representative of Red Vienna, he had to condone to a verdict that was delivered in the black provinces at a time when the summer resort anti-Semitism flourished in Western Austria. So unmasking Jewish, uh, Jews in alpine dress in Tracht as, as a camouflage and uh, presumptuousness was a popular anti-Semitic theme that spread in the right-wing media at the time, and I think you could compare this to this mocking of the like Wilhelm Tell costume. And the local area along the Danube, the Strudengau, was characterized by the defending lawyer Gürtler as German heartland of the Nibelungenlied. Thus, the defendant should not be blamed for calling the betrayal of German loyalty Schufterei at the banks of the Nibelungen River, as he said. Gürtler himself was the son of the local mayor, who was also a member of, the, of parliament for the Christian socials. So this fact would not necessarily improve Deutsch's position in the Grein courtroom. The discourse was heated on both sides. The social democratic media attacked Reinl as a true Hakenkreuzler type, a blustering monarchist, and wrote about black and yellow traitors of the people, and Habsburg blood people. Moreover, they tried to define Deutsch's relation to the demos in a different way from their anti-Semitic opponents. With his subversive actions in the Ministry of War, Deutsch did not betray the Rütli oath of the proletarians. Comrade Deutsch, quote, did only his duty as a human being and a German Austrian. All his actions were fueled by the thought of bringing peace to the German people that he loves with all his heart said the liberal Neuss Wiener Tagblatt about Deutsch's testimonial. For the Christian socials, these lines of argument were only evidence for the social democrats' role 
as a protection party of the Jews. And the Linzer Volksblatt tried to provoke the local workers by invoking the provincial social democrats' reservations against the Jews of the Wienzeile, the party headquarters. Quote, we will not resent their joy if the workers are that happy with their Jewish representatives. So to conclude, after the final verdict in November 1923, the Christian social media celebrated and defended the court decision. The social democratic press, however, agreed that the judges had broken the law in full consciousness in an act of class-biased judiciary. Quote, a mon monarchistic verdict was decided in the fasti courtroom in Linz, Muffige Gerichtsstube, a deliberate insult of the Republic, said the Arbeiterzeitung. The verdict also shocked the liberal press. The österreichische Volkswirt named it a clear misjudgment, and the Wiener Sonn- und Montagszeitung stated, no one who also respects the political opponent's honor will agree with this insane verdict. In Parliament, it was Karl Renner who wanted to remind the bourgeoisie that they owed their current existence, not least to Julius Deutsch, whose statements like actions in the weeks of revolutionary tur turmoil in 1918 had supported the relatively peaceful transition from empire to republic. But, quote, the same social segments and methods that ruined the old empire were now at work to ruin the new republic. This conclusion by the old black and yellow Regierungssozialist Renner, as Friedrich Adler called him, leads us back to the core topic of our conference. It seems that in, in, in Deutsch's courtroom speech and in the political conflicts with the Christian socials, the old empire had actually vanished from Deutsch and the party's political horizon and was only serving as a negative foil for the achievements of New Vienna and the New Republic. As an internationalist socialist, however, Deutsch engaged in the establishment of networks that could be seen as the continuing of old Central European ties, even if they also included Germany. This especially holds true for his activities in the Socialist Workers International that had their offices in Vienna, Leipzig, and Prague, as you can see here on the Briefkopf. And having written key texts on sports and the labor movement, the non-Jewish Jew Deutsch became, for instance, and perhaps without his full approval, a guiding figure for the Jewish labor movement in Poland, former Galicia. For Morgenstern, the anti-Zionist workers' sport organization of the General Jewish Labor Bund, his brochure Sport und Politik served as a main influence that was translated twice into Yiddish. Um, after 1945, with the experience of fascism, remigration, and the incipient Cold War, Deutsch was, would depict his relation to the empire less antagonistic and also in a kind of familiar way. In his autobiography, Ein Weiter Weg, published in 1960, he pointed to the somehow state-preserving power of the social democrats in the empire and said that their international character had made them a uniting force. But, quote, the leading circles of the imperial court, the administration, and the military which dominated the state did not realize this. They considered the social democrats as enemies of the state, granted them reluctantly some concessions in the social sector, but did not have a scrap of political trust for them. In this regard, the traditional disagreements of worldviews were too deep, said Deutsch. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to welcome again Lisa Silverman, Associate Professor of History and Jewish Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. She is the author, uh, of course, of Becoming Austrians, Jews and Culture Between the World Wars, um, co-author of Holocaust Representations in History, uh, Making Place, Space, and Embodiment in the City, as well as Interwar Vienna Culture Between Tradition and Modernity. She's a specialist in modern European Jewish history with interests in German and Austrian Jewish culture, vis visual culture, and gender. And today she will be uh, speaking on Jewish difference in an Austrian nation, Austria from monarchy to republic. 
Thank you. Thanks very much. And um, thanks very much to Malachi for having me here. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so Austrian Jews' loyalty to the Habsburg monarchy is legendary and verified by countless diary entries, published and unpublished memoirs, newspaper articles, etc. And the reasons why Jews were such devoted subjects are easy to understand. The political structure of the state, as well as the multiplicity of nations, languages, and religions within the borders of Austria-Hungary, accounted for Jews' ability to situate themselves as equal subjects. And many of you are probably already very familiar with Marsha Rosenblatt's description of Austrian Jews having a, um, a very comfortable tripartite identity in terms of identifying with the German Kulturnation, uh, being loyal citizens of the state, and then also being able to reconcile a religious Jewish um, orientation very easily without conflict. And moreover, the state, as personified by the emperor, was considered also an important source of protection and stability. So for these reasons, maintaining a strong sense of Austrianness was central for their self-identification as Jews, and that's a point that's relatively uncontested in um, Austrian Jewish, among Austrian Jewish historians. So it comes as little surprise that after the emperor's death and the dissolution of the dual monarchy, many Austrian Jews deeply mourned both. Many Jews who would later become diehard socialists, Zionists, and otherwise avoid associations with an old, inefficient, and authoritarian state system admit that their families continued um, to remember the emperor as, as, a, as a strong representative of a state that protected them, and in private, in, among their families, continued to uphold that nostalgia. And indeed, many, if not most of the best known interwar Austrian writers idealizing the dual monarchy were either Jews or from Jewish families. To be sure, as Malachi has noted, some of them came to their nostalgia only belatedly. The best known writers like Josef Wodt, Franz Werfel, Stefan Zweig, poignantly reflected a sense of loss in their portrayals of the dual monarchy only after their hopes that they had had for politics and culture in the First Republic had been shattered. Um, as Malachi notes, quote, theirs was a nostalgia born out of despair, unquote. But even if Jews' nostalgia for the dissolved dual monarchy was actually more uneven in the interwar period than typically described, it nevertheless remained a trait that was strongly associated with Jews. And in fact, I argue that a closer examination of how interwar Austrian writers articulated Jews' support for the dual monarchy suggests that there's more to how they depicted Jewish Habsburg loyalty than initially meets the eye. Understanding how writers used it in the context of interwar political and social change can help us better understand its role in shaping all Austrian self-understandings in the New Republic. It can also tell us more about the role of Jewish difference in the emergence of the so-called Habsburg myth. What emerges from this examination is that Jews' loyalty to the monarchy was elevated into a trait that was so overdetermined after the dissolution of the empire that Jewish and non-Jewish writers alike could deploy it to either idealize or to criticize the terms of the old empire. By either emphasizing or downplaying what was Jewish about Habsburg loyalty, Austrian writers could clarify and critique the chaotic political, social, and economic circumstances in the New Republic. The interwar period was a time, as has been noted, when all Austrians were forced to shape and deal with finding new self-understandings out of a world in disarray. And as I've argued in Becoming Austrians, Jews in particular found their formerly stable sense of self-identification shaken to the core, especially since many of the most civic-minded Jews in the dual monarchy had considered themselves incomparably Austrian. And in an intense yet vexed investment in culture served as an important means of shaping the contours of those new self-understandings as Austrians. Moreover, in that period, Jews served a critical, as a critical figurative symbol as the other necessary against which Austrians could define themselves. As all Austrians reconceptualized themselves along new national, provincial, and urban lines, those self-conceptions increasingly relied upon long-standing prejudices and stereotypes of the Jew as the ultimate other to help define their terms. And we've seen some of that today. So whether it was a national level or provincial level, et cetera, the Jew was the ultimate other, was often the ultimate other. So depicting Habsburg loyalty as Jewish in the interwar period was just one way that this Jewish othering could be deployed. Okay, so, um, and. I'm going to skip right now to the example to show more specifically that, as ironic as it may seem, 
even explicitly anti-anti-Semitic authors, okay, even those authors trying to argue against anti-Semitism and its ills, could end up reinforcing stereotypical notions of the Jew as inferior to the non-Jew, okay, even as they aim to, on the surface, as they claim, laud a specific Austrian Jewish patriotism. Okay? And this is because, ultimately, while Austria's First Republic may have provided a platform for Jews to help shape mainstream culture as part of this void, it had little room for what was described or labeled as Jewish when it came to forming new conceptions of the Austrian. Okay. So describing Habsburg loyalty as Jewish or insisting that it was not Jewish was one way that interwar writers could articulate these larger concerns, whether they were Jews or not. So to illustrate more specifically what I mean by this, I'm going to turn to the interwar period's most well-known literary portrayal of Jewish Habsburg loyalty. Um, one that was already mentioned this morning by Helmut. It was a play published by Franz Theodor Trocker in 1936 and first staged at Vienna's Burgtheater from March 10th to December 11th in 1937, titled Dritte November 1918 and subtitled Ende der Armee Österreich Ungarns. And I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this example, of course, um, as it's often referenced as illustrative of Austrian Jews' loyalty to the empire. But what I'm going to do is go into a little more detail about it because once you scratch the surface of this very famous scene that many people know, um, there's a, it turns out there's a lot more to be said about this depiction of Habsburg Jewish loyalty. So I'm sure you, a lot of people know the example. It, um, it's often referenced. The three-act play takes place in the Corinthian Alpine Hotel located on the border between Slovenia and Austria that had been turned into a convalescent home for a group of soldiers of various nationalities and ethnicities, Hungarian, Bohemian, Polish, Italian, and two different kinds of Corinthians, as it was mentioned, one ethnic Slovene from Kain and one ethnic German. And that will also become an important subplot in the play as well, that those Corinthian tensions. Other characters include a train engineer from Vienna, a cook, and a Jewish doctor named Grun, as well as a nurse, the only woman in the play. The setting is given as early November 1918, and the group is so isolated that they don't learn about the armistice ending the war until another officer will come and bring them the news from the outside. So after they learn of the war's end, the group's former friendships and solidarity breaks down into conflicts stemming from petty nationalism and local ethnic fervor. The highest ranking officer, Colonel von Radosin, who only moments earlier had led the group in a giddy toast, praising the fatherland as a country that transcends nationality and the army's unity, suddenly finds himself in deep, deep despair at the willingness of the officers now to abandon their loyalty and duty. He is so overcome that he leaves the room, after which a shot off stage indicates his suicide. The next day, the men bury the colonel and, plans to and they make plans to disperse to their respective homelands. The play ends with the, with the two Corinthian soldiers remaining, as they are already home, now poised to violently defend their homelands from one another. Um, it's, it's at the start of the final act that the oft-cited display of Jewish Habsburg loyalty takes place. Act three begins with the officers gathered around the colonel's open grave. They wish to pay their final respects, but even this display of honor is now colored by the men's new nationalistic loyalties. The captain is first to shovel dirt into the grave while calling out, Earth from Hungary. He's followed by the Polish first lieutenant who proclaims Earth from Poland. And so it continues with officers throwing in dirt from Carinthia, Kain, Bohemia, and, and Trient. Then it is Grun's turn. When he throws in the dirt, he proclaims Earth from Austria, thereby indicating that he is the only one left to proclaim loyalty to the emperor, uh, empire instead of the successor states, and thus symbolizing Jews as the only remaining Habsburg loyalists. And this is why this, this line gets often repeated um, and held out as the example. So the scene is typically used to illustrate the Austrian perception of Jews as among the most loyal citizens of Austria-Hungary and the most mournful of its loss. But examination of the scene in the context of how Grun's Jewishness is depicted elsewhere in the play offers a more nuanced understanding of that final shovelful of dirt. We first encounter Dr. Grun in Act One, when Kaminsky, the noble-looking Polish lieutenant, comes to the dining hall complaining to the porter and the cook about his health and his homesickness. Just after he finishes blessing Poland and crossing himself, Grun enters. In contrast, the doctor is described as small, red-haired, and nearsighted. 
He rushes in, demanding einen braunen, passiert, mit Schlag, ein rechtes Kepferl, as well as a fine cigar, three cubes of sugar, and the daily newspapers from England, France, and Italy. <laughs> Pretty ridiculous, right? A request more appropriate to a Viennese cafe than an isolated mountain convalescent home. Kaminsky, in a lighthearted reference to the iodine that he's likely receiving as medication from the doctor, greets Grün as Dr. Jod, because Jod means iodine in German and in Polish. So to which Grün then gently acknowledges this pun and playfully corrects him. He says, Jod heißt Kaminsky, genährt euch nur nicht, er denkt es euch sowieso. So this scene immediately is, is immediately followed by another scene that offers Grün the opportunity to show, on one hand, that he's well aware that there's this underlying, mild, almost playful anti-Semitism among the ar army officers, as well as the fact that neither he nor they take it seriously. When the other officers enter the room, singing, laughing, and boasting to one another about their prowess with women, the Hungarian captain says, Doctor, in Budapest geht jetzt dein Witz, and then Grün immediately cuts him off right there, claiming to know already what he's going to say. And he states, Weiß schon, ein Säbel, da, drängt, da, da dran hängt ein Jud. Wer soll das sein? Regimentsdarzt. To which everyone then just starts laughing. In this instant, as in the last with Kaminsky, nobody actually utters an, a slur against Jews. Rather, they are anticipated, verbalized, and then dismissed by Grün himself. And in the next act, he intervenes to attempt to stop the colonel from hitting one of the officers just after the news of the demise of Austria-Hungary has just been announced. So he doesn't always just remain some kind of passive observer. So despite these markings of his Jewishness, in these and in several other instances, Rune is without a doubt sympathetically portrayed as a man of kindness, care, and reason. Ironically, Grün is also marked as a Jewish other by way of the trait that, in theory, should make him the most likely candidate to be a true Austrian, his loyalty to the empire. Significantly, as Judith Beniston has pointed out, there are actually th not one, but three characters who are associated with Austria-Hungary. Colonel Radosin's lines actually reveal his highly romanticized, deep and heartfelt loyalty to the dual monarchy, such as in the speech that I mentioned right before they learn of the dissolution. And the nurse Christina, the only woman in the play who left in Act One to search for medicine, reemerges at the end of Act Three, announcing that the war is over by repeatedly calling out Frieden, Frieden. She becomes the mouthpiece for Choker's final message as she rejects the German Corinthians officer's vision of a new world formed out of nationalities and links herself firmly to the buried colonel by stating, Meine Welt liegt unter dem Hügel am Fenster, referring to his buried body. Notably, it is she, and not Grün, who proclaims how devoted she became to the emperor after her own father died, and how it was linked to her Christianity. Da hieß dann der Kaiser, mein Vater, in allen Gängen und Stuben hing immer sein Bild, immer, immer er neben dem Heiland am Kreuz. Her Christian Habsburg loyalty, which is already apparent in her name, Christina, is cemented toward the end of the play, when she insists the colonel is not really dead in spirit, but rather, Der Oberste stirbt nie, er kommt wieder. Thus linking together the colonel, the emperor he stood for, and Jesus Christ. In contrast to the thoughtful, heartful reflections of the colonel, in the anti-nationalist Christian patriotism of the nurse for Austria-Hungary, Grun's loyalty remains coded as distinctly Jewish, and that is light, overly rational, and superficial. For example, at the funeral, as the soldiers mourn the colonel, Grun lectures on the dry historical details of when and why the colors of the Austrian flag changed from black, yellow, to red, white, red, something nobody else appears to listen to or care about. Later, when the men are musing about the thousand-year-old empire and the palavach that helped to bring about its demise, Grun defends it not with heartfelt poetic lamentations, but with the rather improbable assertion that the same tendency toward Palavach helped it to exist for so long as a defense against Turks, the Reformation, and even Napoleon, who were unable to implement all of their plans because of it. Like the nurse, he too wants peace, but he reveals that his brand of peace stems from the head, not from the heart, when he claims, nur aus dem Kopf kommt sie wieder zum Frieden. Okay, so he says that he claims that unprompted. In fact, Grün reveals the deepest emotional response he can muster for the empire when he bursts out unexpectedly, 
dass er recht gehabt hat, der Tote da draußen. Denn in uns war schon wirklich mehr als ein Volk. So ein Geist war in uns von etwas, das bei den anderen erst vor der Tür steht. Und jetzt, seit das fort ist, rennt ihr herum wie Schafe im Wetter mit euren Nationen und springst dabei jedem Hammel noch nach in den Abgrund. On one hand, here he is certainly the voice of reason, critiquing the mindless and potentially dangerous allure of national sentiment. But it is also true that he can't say anything more specific about what the empire offered in comparison to nations other than a, an allusion to a weak and vague sense of spirit. His assertion is the perfect setup for the anti-Semitic Corinthian soldier, the, the German nationalist, who menacingly tells Dr. So who menacingly tells Grün, Doctor, auf Geist dieser Art wird verzichtet und auf euren Geist ganz besonders. Wind aus der Wüste, das ist eure Geist. Er reizt bloß und macht keinen Satz. To be sure, this exchange seeks to expose the officer's unfair and unwarranted anti-Semitism. But in order to make this point, Choker portrays Jews' connection to the Habsburg Empire as as unemotional, rational, and simply not as deep as the loyalties of the others. Seen in that light, Grun's shovelful of earth actually tells us more about the portrayal of Jewish Habsburg loyalty in the interwar period than it does about Jews' actual attachment to the dual monarchy. It's notably not Dr. Grun, but the other officers who decide to throw the earth in the grave and call out their national loyalties proudly and without hesitation. Grun is actually not even at the grave during the burial, but rather inside the house where he's tending to his sick patient. Um, he cautions him, to, he cautions the Polish officer to be careful from throwing out the window, um, very concerned about his health. And while the others continue to bury the leader and profess their new national loyalties, Grun leads Kaminsky back to bed, arranges his pillows, and begins to discuss their upcoming trip to Poland. And so he's thus taken aback when the Italian officer, as the last to throw in the earth, notices that someone's missing, and as an afterthought, hands the shovel to Grun through the window. And Grun, embarrassed, hesitates before throwing in the dirt, finally stammering, Erde aus, Erde aus, Österreich. So Chokor was in no way an anti-Semitic, and I don't think it's, it's either accurate or helpful to portray him as such, or to portray this portrayal of Grun as anti-Semitic. Nevertheless, The portrayal of the doctor's loyalty engages Jewish difference not by decrying the negative stereotypical traits attributed to Jews and things Jewish, but rather by highlighting and sustaining them. Significantly, Choker's portrayal of Jewish loyalty to the monarchy was deemed too controversial for the stage in 1937, despite the fact that Choker included a disclaimer that this play was not supposed to offend any nations. Yet, the Burgtheater producers insisted that Grun's line at the burial should be changed to Erde aus Österreich Ungarn instead of Österreich in order to ensure that the audience knew what he was referring to. But even this change was not enough to appease the authorities because after a few performances, that loon, the, the line was cut entirely, um, about which Choker complained bitterly, complaining that basically he knew that this was done to appease uh, violent anti-Semites. Okay. Some reviewers, however, had no problem with this omission. In a glowing article praising the play as Choker's Gipfelwerk, writer Oscar Fontana omitted the Jewish doctor entirely, even when he listed all of the other characters in the play. In his review for the Neue Freie Presse, author Felix Salten, whose own, own works had already been banned in Germany by then, only mentions the Jewish doctor to note that the actor who plays him actually embodied the character with tact, discretion, and clever warmth. Likewise, Hans Brecker, the reviewer for the Reichspost, mentions the doctor only to praise the performance of Herr Heim, who, as he put it, betont vorsichtig das Jüdische an dem Regimentsarzt. Quote. Neither of those two mention the controversy surrounding the omission of his line, uh, professing his loyalty to Austria, but the critic for the Zionist newspaper, Die Stimme, noted bitterly that the doctor's line about Austria presented it in the published version of the play from 1936 was first changed to Österreich Ungarn and then cut entirely, leaving a silent Dr. Grun to shovel earth into the grave. Despite what the Zionist reviewer felt were otherwise tactful portrayers of this Jewish character, he took both director and author to task for giving in to the anti-Semitism of others, especially when so many Jews had fought and died for Austria-Hungary. Choker's play does underscore the fact that Jews had much to lose with the demise of the dual monarchy and indeed mourning its loss. 
Um, immediately after its dissolution, some, such as Yosef Samuel Bloch, the rabbi, member of the Reichsrat, and publisher of the Jewish newspaper Österreichische Wochenschrift, had suggested right after the end of the war that Jews were the only unconditional Austrians and thus should logically form the core of the new multinational state. But Bloch's notion that Jews' political loyalty would translate directly and easily into a new Austrian national sensibility would prove false. And as the controversy surrounding the performance of the play in 1937 makes clear, Jews went from considering, selves the, considering themselves the most Austrian to realizing they had become the least Austrian, a process that had been proceeding through the interwar period. Okay. Um, although here I've only discussed one example, I want to suggest that it may be fruitful to examine more closely how other Austrian authors, both Jewish and non-Jewish, likewise engaged the terms of Jewish difference in their portrayals of Habsburg loyalty. Given that so many of the writers and historians who helped reshape the image of the monarchy were Jews, and how often a Jewish loyalty to the monarchy, or on the other hand, a loyalty to the monarchy stripped of any Jewish overtones, was used to articulate that image, it's worth noting that using Jewish difference as an analytic category can help reevaluate the shaping of this myth and the use of that in other officers. In conclusion, the irony of Choker's portrayal of Jewish Habsburg loyalty as dry and superficial is clear from the spirited and passioned writings of Austrian Jews who lived during the era, which underscore the fact that the dual monarchy remains close to their hearts. As, as Malachi HaCohen notes, Jews were the only group to adopt enthusiastically the, the official Staatsgedanke, the Austrian imperial idea, the ideology of dynastic patriotism. And in the interwar period, Jews who supported the Republic instead of mourning for the empire also showed a strong need to hold on to a spiritual idea of Austria. In Austria between the wars, the terms of Jewish difference played a crucial, if often unrecognized, role in the shaping of culture, including the portrayal of Austria-Hungary. And as I've argued elsewhere, the manifestations of these terms indicate that the self-understandings of Austrian Jews between the wars had as much to do with knowing when not to appear Jewish as they did with embracing traditional mainsprings of Jewish culture. In their portrayals of Habsburg loyalty, I suggest that all Austrian writers had to know whether to portray it as Jewish or not in order to make their points about the empire and how it should be remembered. Thank you. It's my pleasure now to introduce our respondent, Ingo Zechner, the director of the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for History and Society, former director of the EFK in Vienna, as well as project manager of ephemeral, fil ephemeral films, Ugh. National Socialism in Austria. He served previously as business manager of the Vienna Weisenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies, head of the IKG in the Jewish Community's Holocaust Victims Information and Support Center. He was the Rob Foundation Fellow at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. in 2013, and has published on philosophical aesthetics, post-structuralist philosophy, film, literature, music, archival theory, and practice, and Holocaust studies. Thank you very much, uh, Serena, and uh, thank you to both of you. So today's the first uh, anniversary of uh, Sigi Mattel's death. And uh, this morning, Sigi's wife, uh, Sylvia, responded uh, to my text message by saying that Sigi's spirit is uh, with us and uh, how right she is. Um, Georg's paper, I think, is the perfect proof when Sigi in 2013 at uh, Empire Socialism and Jews number two presented his paper on Charlotte Glass, he made a very smart strategic move by picking a trial as a starting point. Uh, Georg did exactly the same in his paper on Julius Deutsch. It is as if they were saying, okay, you want to talk about the empire. So let's talk about the empire's institutions. Let's talk about the leading circles of the imperial court, the administration, and the military, which dominated the state, as uh, Georg put it in a quote from Julius Deutsch's autobiography. And they won't leave much room for nostalgia. The lost honor of uh, Julius Deutsch could be an alternative title of Georg's paper. Or if you're looking for a more provocative title, no honor for Jews. The communist paper, Rote Fahne, may have been right that a true revolutionary should be proud of the insults of a monarchist and uh, will not go to a bourgeois court, um, not only 
from a political point of view, but also from a legal perspective, Julius Deutsch may have been simply ill-advised to start a lawsuit of honor against his insulter. His uh, courtroom speech makes that perfectly clear when he argues that he had to choose between the officer's oath and the sense of community with the working people. And uh, I think that's close to admitting that he had to break his officer's oath. This made it uh, quite easy for the defendants to argue that he was simply stating a fact when he accused Deutsch of uh, Wilhelmish deeds, Schuftereien, as uh, yeah, it was put in the original German term, provided at least uh, a villain is not always an insult and uh, at least an appropriate term for somebody who breaks his oath. And uh, this also reminds us that honor is always a question of rhetorics. What is considered honorable is uh, disputed based on what's called uh, a topos in rhetorics, a widely accepted assumption. I had to break my oath in order to keep faith with the working people. That's what uh, Deutsch is really saying. In order not to become a villainous traitor of the people, Deutsch had to make his choice. So socialist betrayal or imperial loyalty, that was the choice, as Georg put his, in his title. Socialist loyalty and imperial betrayal would be another alternative title. And I think it's most telling that uh, socialist loyalty and imperial loyalty is not among the available options, especially the end in between. But uh, what makes this trial so interesting is that both the plaintiff and the defendant went uh, beyond well-accepted uh, topoi of contemporary rhetorics. The, f the defendants, by, using, by introducing the question of Jewish difference into Austrian identity, the plaintiff by introducing the question of force into taking an oath. So what the defendant says, says and I quote, a man of such inferior moral qualities who because of his descent has nothing to do with the Austrian people cannot claim to be celebrated as a national hero, end of quote. So that's the words of uh, the defending lawyer, Gürtler, as we learned from Georg. So we learn Jews cannot be national heroes, at least not Austrian national heroes, because they are even not Austrians at all. Julius Deutsch, uh, on the other hand, did not try to argue that being Jewish made him even a better Austrian hero than other Austrians. So uh, a move we are to some extent uh, trying to make uh, today or with our workshop series. And uh, of course, uh, this also involves uh, the question who decides who is Jewish, or to put it in Lisa's terms, who decides about uh, Jewish difference. The plaintiff, uh, Julius Deutsch, on the other hand, uh, says that uh, yeah, uh, about the, uh, the, the officer's oath, oath that he didn't give it by choice. And uh, he also says, uh, yeah, a, a subject's loyalty to the emperor whom I never recognized voluntarily. Who, in the honor of, uh, or, the male, uh, or the male pride uh, of a Republican who in the, on the hour of emergency stands by his people and not with the blood-stained arch house of Habsburg. Um, and so, so Georg comes to the conclusion that uh, in Deutsch's courtroom speech of 1923, the old empire had actually vanished from Deutsch uh, had actually vanished from Deutsch and the party's political horizon and was only serving as a negative foil for the achievements of New Vienna and the New Republic. While uh, Lisa argues that uh, in the interwar period, Jews who supported the Republic instead of mourning for the empire also showed a strong need to hold on to a spiritual idea of Austria. And uh, the question I'd like to ask is, uh, when did the spiritual, uh, spiritual idea emerge, did it emerge uh, before 1933? And uh, we could uh, 
also extend that kind of question to the subtitle of our uh, conference, of, uh, of our conference here, and also uh, yeah, uh, the title of your paper, Lisa, um, the interwar years, uh, did they start before 1933 at all? Isn't that a kind of uh, retrospective uh, projection, uh, and uh, isn't it strongly connected to the remilitarization of Germany in 1933, and uh, yeah, uh, somehow putting the end uh, on to the beginning? And I think if we talk about uh, Joker's play, we also have to talk about the exact year when it was published and staged at Vienna's Burgtheater. We have to talk about 1936 and 1937. So um, the play actually followed uh, the so-called July agreements between uh, Austria and uh, Germany. And uh, yeah, uh, the change, the entire political situation in Austria, at least the interior political situation. The dispute, the dispute about the elimination of the line Earth from Austria is, I think, entirely about the relation between Catholic fascist Austria and Nazi Germany and not so much about the relation to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, if we are talking about the empire and the Habsburg monarchy, we are, uh, there's another question involved. Are we really talking about uh, equal terms? In uh, your first footnote, Lisa, um, you address some of the terminological problems involved. Uh, the Austrian Empire does not include Hungary. Uh, that's why you also use uh, the term dual monarchy, Austria-Hungary, or Habsburg monarchy. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, they all include, uh, of course, uh, the structure, so uh, from the empire top down uh, to the institutions. And uh, if we're talking about uh, um, socialist uh, loyalty to the empire, do we always include uh, the institutions and the emperor, or do we only refer to the question of nationalities? And uh, to come to an end with my commentary, I would only like to say that uh, Dr. Green, as uh, a non-nationalist Jew, does probably doesn't have uh, any other nation to refer to than uh, the by then non-nation Austria in his play. Okay. German nationalists argue that the empire, that they, the Jews betrayed the empire. Since, I mean, as of course, I mean, the truth is that we betrayed the empire. I mean, it's the German nationalists that, that, that advanced that. But they managed somehow to claim that in the mid 1920s, after the empire was split between 1918, the 
in 1918, some of them said ownership that's being claimed here, right, over the imperial project. And instead of the socialists coming and saying, yeah, no, we were loyal, he's not in a position to do that. So what the thing that is so remarkable about Dr. Deutsch, the way he is caught in the contradiction, he is caught in the contradiction of socialist discourse about imperialism. He can't come out and say, look, I was, what at some point, at one point he says in 1917, I was loyal in 1917. We were loyal to the empire to the very end. You are the traitors. No, he has to say that that's not the case because he has precisely, you know, this was not, this was an oppressive empire and so on. I had to bring, I had to break by, I had to break by uh, uh, my, my loyalty. Uh, what does it attempt to argue? It is attempt to argue, to argue that they are, the argument against him is based on class. He's being excluded from the hiking, not on account of his ethnicity, but on account of his country. The thing is, the, the issue here is that the nation has been racialized and ethnicized to such an extent that, that Deutsch does not have a wound there. It's not, he does not manage to pretend himself to come across as a socialist. That's what he wants. That's what he dies to. A Republican and a socialist to be recognized. And he can't be. And what, 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 what do we right now know to be the case of Deutsch going go with century later? We go and try to argue for it. Do we continue to fight the same fight? Do we are going to continue to, say, to lose the same elections? Because we are, going, we are arguing exactly the same way today, right? They're making the same alliances today. The alliances today. Instead of, interestingly enough, in this entire paper, I mean, who accepted the notions about the Jews really being consolidated and so on? That's the only place where we said, Okay, leave the issues of the Jews alone. Leave the issue that they could be called up and assassinated, they could not be played like that. Ah, but this is what you would expect from the Marxist discourse. The only one who takes the Marxism are, the representative, are those who are the representatives of the, who see in the Marxism the, the challenge to the national order. And yet, the nation has not got an alliance as, as, uh, alliances as well. So, in short, the question that I'm asking is actually here about how the. <coughs> How does this the, the most how does this ridiculous thing happen? That is that the right managed the nationalists managed to claim somehow ownership over the empire and bring a Jew to court on the fact that he betrayed the empire, which they betrayed, and the Jew is incapable of saying I was loyal to the empire and you were not. Okay, uh, that's the, 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 the problem here. And I think I mean actually what the the, the, the move that Lisa made I mean is an interesting one. You see that she's very interested in that is to think about the way. In which, in which the um, the way in which one sees the Jewish relationship to the empire determines the type of empire that you see, and determines the type of politics that you have. Because the major Catholic project, German project of the interwar period, is to rule the Jews out of the death of the of that life, out of the original the regeneration of the life. Their right is Islam Deutsch, and the Jews have somehow to be sidelined. They cannot recognize uh, that. And that's actually the, that's what Storz, I mean, really forged in that sense. I mean, it's, I mean, you may underestimate it. I mean, that it's directed against such project. It reimagines the empire with Jewish membership in it and with the Jewish, the Jewish constituent partners. That's the revolutionary act that's, that, that's carried on there. But you're absolutely right that this is the key to see the way in which the Jews are configured the, 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 uh, into the imperial imagination tells us everything about the politics. Now, as you know, I told you this tonight, I disagree completely with your analysis I mean, of the uh, uh, Lippmann. I disagree with your analysis of the, of the play itself, because what I see here, you're absolutely right, he's playing with the Jewish stereotype as the cosmopolitan, rationalist, the lover of life, I mean, the life and so on. But what there is, is and the empire is Christian. Granted, granted that the empire, that he does have Christian, Christian humanist vision of the, of the empire. But the entire idea is, you see, now, well, that's the old idea of benevolent and gentle Austria, right? Well, that, well there was anti-Semitism, surely enough, but I mean, it was all out of Papa and not really, and, and not, not really serious, and it could be negotiated. And then you have, of course, the Catholics who are people. And there are the Jews who are the rationals, the and that's an essential component of the empire. This is why the empire was great. It was all, it was both of those together, and those were necessary. And what you see actually the Jew, the, the Jew and the Nevers, as I mentioned, they are the doctor and the nurse, they are the cleavers. They are those who keep life. And of course he's not burying the empire, he's taking care of the Polish patients, 
and you imagine how he's going to do it, do it, do it, do it as, as from the Poland, from back to Poland, because for him, he still had the, the empire in, 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 in his head, those crossing of the national border, and then taking care of the Pol of the of the of, of the Polish army. So I see that as a much kinder and gentle uh, a, um, um, view. I mean, much more uh, the final Semitic view, if you wish, of empire than see, while recognizing that it is, of course, within the Christian, uh, within the Christian vision of the um, of, of the uh, of the empire. Um, and the thing that brings together that the comment from the Ego, I do think that 1933 has something to do with the reemergence of kind and gentle Austria. It existed before, I grant it. But I mean, the thing is, it's, the Jews did try to give a chance to the Austrian nation, to, to, to the Austrian nation state. And so it's the failure that, the failure that gave rise to those. As a Catholic project, though, the gentle Austria, as a Jewish hand, as a Jewish Catholic project, you have the gentle Austria, the gentle Austria by all of the earlier, and Brown and others already in the, in the 1920s. And therefore, what one can construct if you're not going to do, because of course you're not going to take Catholic seriously, right? Um, is compare the Jewish Catholic vision versus the German Catholic vision of empire in the 19, in the 1920s. And therefore, is precisely the role that the Jew would play in that type of process, may be well within the, the extreme, extreme variety of nationalizing German Catholic views versus the Jewish Catholic, I mean, it's in the, it emerged from the Hoffman style and the Just uh, to add a few uh, uh, points. Thank you so much. This uh, brilliant papers opens a lot, a lot of, a lot of questions. But I think this step in the back that you mentioned uh, that uh, that comes that the whole discourse in the in the twenties is a discourse on the on the loss of the central powers and not the loss of the Habsburg monarchy. It's the German national discourse already in Austria. We lost the war because of the step in the back, and the step in the back came from Jewish. Uh, uh, Freemasons, whatever, around the world. So, so this German perspective on the end of the war uh, uh, took over the Austrian discourse in, in, in the 20s. So, so it was easy to, to say what is we, and thinking this is the German-speaking world. Yeah? We lost against the French and, and, and the others because of. Yeah? This is no longer the monarchy, it's, it's, a, it's this, this German national Central Europe, uh, 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 and, and so the number two, not democracy plays its part. Uh, it, it, it just uh, deforming the Habsburg history to a German uh, European uh, uh, history at the end, at the end of, of, of World War One. And the second thing, I think, uh, uh, if you uh, Ingo said that Joker's play came in uh, 1936, and you have to mention 1936, Joker was not the, the fast, uh, was not so fast. In, in writing his, his his drama, so he started at least a year or even uh, uh, two years earlier, and and I think the main the main uh, uh, drive for him to to, 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 to start this play was uh, 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 1933 and then uh, uh, 1934 uh, that the Ständestadt tried to show to be the better German uh, uh, perspective in in, in this in, in, in this thirties. And this better German perspective has also space for a Jewish uh, uh, identity. The Nazis didn't have this, but the good old traditions built up from the longer cultural and better cultural perspective from Vienna compared to this Babinus up there in, 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 in Berlin, yeah, uh, uh, opens a perspective that in, in, in includes the Jews. So it's not a reaction on, on, on 1936, it's a reaction on 1933, 1934, uh, uh, so, 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 so I got it in, 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 in my mind. It was brilliant to, to see it so, so clear because we always, we always, uh, 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 in the last years, I only look into this one sequence on the on, on, on the grave with the showers of of, of, of earth in there. But to, to, to bring it to a broader perspective is absolutely helpful to understand that this is the construction of a of a better German state uh, 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 behind this, and this is the Austrian Städtenstaat. Bella first. No, oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, I only want to uh, add two, two uh, small comments. Uh, to first of all, to Lisa's um, uh, nice, uh, I think very interesting interpretation of, of Chokra's uh, drama. Uh, I think, should we, could it be that uh, Chokra, who wrote in 33, 34, 35, 
mirrors the situation of Jews within the Dolphin Shooting regime, which was a much more rational, uh, uh, less uh, evil than, than Nazi Germany, which means they have to support uh, Shooting and Dolphin because they were not free like, like uh, in Nazi Germany, but it was not really a relationship uh, that could be compared with some part of the Jews in the later monarchy, which really felt were, were big supporters of Franz Josef, and they were some they have some pictures and, mm -hmm. uh, in, in their in their homes, which they are really adoring Franz Josef as one of their saviors. So, and this is completely different with the relationship to the regime from thirty three to thirty eight which is a much more, uh, I, don't, I don't mention Jewish people who are uh, supporters of the social democrats or members of the social democrats because it's, the regime is a hostile uh, uh, relationship. But the others, the more bourgeois, they support the regime or because it's the less uh, problem for them. Could it be that this uh, Dr. Grün portrait is a little bit mirroring this uh, situation of Jews let's say 34 to 38, this is my question. And another, excuse me, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to Georg, uh, one additional remark. Uh, I find it interesting that the late Julius Deutsch, the, his memories, uh, how he portrays the late monarchy is a little bit similar to how Karl Renner in the Second Republic mm -hmm. reflects his views and, and, and his career mm -hmm. in the, in the Okay, yes, I just, um, so I'll, you know, there's lots of different points, but just to respond specifically to, to your point, which ties into what Malachi was saying and also to what others have said. So it may well be that, and I don't, I don't doubt that Chokor had in mind addressing specific, uh, the specific political and social situation of the time in when he was writing the play in the early, 30, the early to mid 30s and in its performance. I don't doubt that. But from my perspective, it, it doesn't matter because what I'm doing is I look at how his portrayal of how, how he engages the terms of Jewish difference as they were done throughout the interwar period. Um, at which point everybody who used it, you can make that same argument whether they did it in the 20s, whether they did it writing from outside Vienna or inside Vienna. What, what I think is most salient about this is that even despite his decidedly anti-anti-Semitic point of view, even with, I, I completely agree that, that, that it's not all a negative portrayal of Jews, even in his, his desire to include Jews in this portrayal of what was good about the empire and what was rational, what was good about it, he still needs to keep the hierarchy in place of Jewish, of what was negative about Jews and what was positive about them, even if he's trying to say, but yes, Jews are, are, are rational and, and it's, it's actually not a bad thing. But, but the point is, is that that's not how it would come across to a lot of, it would play right into the hands of people who already coded Jews as overly rational and negative. So do you see what I'm saying? Even if it was done with trying to address the certain specific circumstances of the time, I think it's interesting that there's, and what I think, what I have found for other writers in that period, there's no way around it unless you're going to do a satire to expose that dichotomy of the Jewish and the non-Jewish, the way Betauer did in the in the 20s, et cetera. There's you, you're not going to communicate your ideas to people other than addressing it that way. So that would be my short answer. Uh, so, may, 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 may you have to have in mind that these are the thirties, and this is and, and the play comes exactly in the new self-imagination of the Ständestadt. You have the Äußere Burgtor, you have the construction of a, of, a, of a new history, of a new understanding, of a new looking back uh, 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 to, to the past, uh, starting in, 19, in, in 1934. And Joker fits only in, in, this, in, in this period, from between 1934 and 1938. He doesn't fit in the in, in the in, in the twenties. So so I'm not with you. I, I, I see much closer. So even that. in that period, he can't do more than reiterate the negative. That's how I would answer that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, Ingo. Uh, 
for the comments and um, thank you Malachi. Um, with, regard, with regard to Malachi's uh, comments, I think yes, you're right that Deutsch in a way avoids to talk about his loyalty to the empire before 1917, but in fact he, he also talks about it because, and I think that's, that's an important point, what he says is that up, like up to a certain point, the social democrats and he as a, as a person like kept the loyalty to the empire, but then he goes on um, when like the army as a central institution of the empire was totally um, less, like lost all its legitimacy uh, because of the First World War and the way, I mean, it was a kind of military dictatorship for some years after 1914, and, and he, as an officer, he reflected quite clear the role of the Habsburg officers in the First World War and also his own role as an officer. And you're right, in a way we are following his arguments here when, when we say when the army or when there was like the threat that the army would be put against like the, the strike, the striking workers, the population of Vienna, this was the point, and, and also the war was lost uh, in early 1918. This was the point when Deutsch and others in the party decided, I guess, to, um, to develop their own plans and think about the future after the empire. And this is what you can also read in his, in his book, Aus Österreichs Revolution, where he like portrays himself as this revolutionary leader and this statesman who, who um, was so important in the transition to the new republic. I mean, sure, this is how he's, how he, you know, it's it's like he, it's like an image that he wants to um, tell about himself. But I think it also captures reality. I think after this. Uh, um, after the, after the war, nothing was the same as uh, uh, in 1914. And, and so I wouldn't say it's all fake and it's just that he doesn't want to talk about the empire. I think it's really gone from his political perspective because what they wanted to do is to, to uh, they say, the, well, look, now we have this new republic. It's our republic. It's the socialist republic. And in 1921, maybe he still thought that, for instance, he, he was... In this book, it was a lot about the new army, this Volkswehr, and he was telling, well, we have to build this new army that is really a people's army that is not, you know, the force of, um, of this uh, old empire that was very uh, hi hierarchical and where the soldiers had no rights and, and so on. So we want to have this new army also because we know that it's crucial to, to make this, I mean, it wasn't really a, revo a revo revolution, but this new state and um, so this is one thing I would yeah what I was just saying that you that he the constraint of socialist discourse mm. which he himself is subjected but you know actually you have someone who tells you who's out there and tells it more open it's strange enough for people right now right? yeah it's yeah. who comes out and tells you that I mean you think you were the trait I mean mm. we were the ones who were loyal first to the empire mm. and now to the nation and this was all done in order to effect a smooth transition mm -hmm. from empire to nation. But why can't Deutsch say that? Mm -hmm. Because he has a different attitude or position to the empire than Venner. Mm. Yeah. It's the German national that we call him, mm -hmm. that, that we were thinking earlier, that operates in, the, in Deutsch in a certainly different way in which it operates in the Venner. Mm -hmm. Inga. My key argument was the question of choice. And uh, when uh, Julius Deutsch discusses the question of choice, he does it twice. So he says, when I took an oath, I didn't have a choice at all. So my loyalty uh, to uh, the emperor is based on force, nothing else. May be true, may not be true, but that's what he says from retrospect. Uh, when I had a choice, I choose uh, the working people, and I didn't choose uh, the emperor because uh, I, couldn't, uh, I didn't have the choice to choose both of them. And uh, Dr. Green, on the other hand, uh, yeah, uh, there, the question of choice is not about, uh, uh, yeah, about acting, about taking an act, about uh, coming to a political decision. It's about uh, identity. 
and uh, the only two choices he could have made was uh, Earth for, uh, to, to say Earth from the nation of Zion or Earth from, the, uh, from Austria. So uh, he decided for good reasons uh, to, uh, yeah, for Austria, in favor of Austria. And he also didn't have a choice. That would be my argument. So uh, given the situation. Can I just add something? It's interesting. I read in the play, they don't ever say where he's from in the play. Um, but I want to add something. Um, he could have said from Vienna, if he was from Vienna, because actually in the period, uh, just as Helmut said, with the provinces, people retreated to a more local identity. Many Jews actually retreated to sort of more Viennese self-identification as well. So that's one thing, or one possibility that could have been there. But they, as I said, in the play, they don't ever say where he's even from. Right, so. The thing is, uh, there's not much earth in Vienna. There's, uh, yeah, it's a city. <laughs> <laughs> there's also the country, it's the yeah. rocks, <laughs> rocks I didn't yes. know where the big there is from. <laughs> Sentence yes. To what Malak has said about like the hijacking of the empire by the like the right wing press and and activists. It's interesting that it's really hard to say, like, to say something about um, Deutsch's opponent, this guy Reinl, because like in the socialist press they call him a Hakenkreuzler, they call him a monarchist. So, I mean, in a way, it, it sounds a little bit like like in the book Black Vienna. That I mean, maybe it is hard to differentiate, and maybe he was a monarchist and he was a Hakenkreuzler. But um, That's, is that possible? Uh, I think I think it tells this you. Is not, this is not Austria. Everything is possible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, first of all, I, I, mean, it, I think it's it's hard to understand. But uh, on the other hand, it also may give us a clue of how the uh, German nationals. Uh, somehow uh, reshaped uh, the war. It was not a war in favor of the emperor or in favor of the emperor. It was a German national exactly. war they fought. Exactly. So let's and let's the back story. Exactly. I, I, I tried to do yes. the German national yeah. war, and, and the two uh, countries lost were German, German mm -hmm. countries, and the step in the back uh, was given to the, against the Germans and not against the Habsburg exactly. Empire. Yeah? Exactly. This, is, this, is, this, is, this is the point of this, the step in the back. Yeah? It doesn't make the situation easier. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want to defend the monarchies, but not all of the German nationalists. <laughs> no, no, no. Did you see that, 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 that period 